welcome back to Killer Stories. I'm your host, Bobby Holmes. I hope you enjoyed last week's special episode. I had so much fun chatting with Stu about his unsolved British murder case. We recorded another joint episode that will air on his podcast next week. This time, I'm telling the story. I'll keep you guys updated when it goes live. As for this week, I'm back to recording solo, and I'm discussing the case of Shanda Scherer. I feel like I did Shanda and her family a huge disservice. The whole episode, I'm calling her Shandra. I am terrible at names. Seriously, I put letters where they don't belong. I don't know what's wrong with me, but the entire time I'm saying Shandra, it is Shanda. I apologize if we could just pretend like that R is not there. It is Shanda Scherer. This case made headlines due to the young age of the girls involved, ranging from 15 to 17 years old, and Shandra herself was only 12. Not only the fact that they were so young, but the unthinkable way in which she died. As usual, I want to get you up to speed on Shandra's history as well as the four girls that participated in her murder. These are some very, very troubled young ladies. Shandra was born October 28, 1979 in Pineville, Kentucky. When she was in the sixth grade, she moved to Louisville after her parents' divorce. Shandra was doing well adjusting to her new school. She was on the cheerleading squad, volleyball, and softball teams. Just when she felt comfortable in Louisville, her mom divorced again. This time, she moved to New Albany, Indiana. I wouldn't necessarily consider Chandra to be a troubled girl. However, I'm sure it wasn't easy with her mom's failed marriages and multiple moves before the age of 12. Now let's dive into the four girls responsible for her death. First up, Melinda Loveless, the ringleader. Melinda was one of three sisters. Her childhood was, honestly, it was horrible. Her parents were Marjorie and Larry Loveless. I don't know where to even begin with Larry. He was abusive to both Marjorie and his girls. Physically, emotionally, and sexually abusive. As far as he was concerned, he and Marjorie had an open marriage. But I don't think she was actually okay with that. It definitely seems one-sided and forced. They, as a couple, would visit local bars where Larry posed as a successful doctor and said Marjorie was his girlfriend. They would bring others home with them, usually multiple people. In reality, Larry was not a doctor. He was a Vietnam War vet who couldn't quite hold down a job. Once he worked as a mailman, but he got fired when they realized he wasn't actually delivering any mail. He just took it home and burned it which that alone I thought would put him in jail. Messing with people's mail is a federal offense, but somehow Larry got away with it. When he was working, he didn't use the money he made to provide for his family. He selfishly spent it all on himself. He would buy cars, motorcycles, and guns. Lots of guns. Meanwhile, some days his family didn't even have food to eat and went hungry. Larry would essentially pimp out his wife, arranging Marjorie to have sex with his friends, once he actually had her gang raped. After that incident, Marjorie had several failed suicide attempts. If you can't tell, Larry is a sick individual. He would pick up the girl's dirty underwear and sniff it in front of everyone, trying to embarrass them. I can't even imagine having a father this twisted. Family testimonies in court state that Larry sexually assaulted Melinda and her sisters starting when they were just babies. Melinda actually slept in Larry's bed until she was 14 years old when he up and left the family. Usually it's a sad thing for a parent to abandon their spouse and children, but I think the loveless women were way better off without him. Want to know why he left? Marjorie caught Larry spying on Melinda and her friends. Doing what, I'm not sure, but given his history, I'm sure it was something like changing or showering. Well, Marjorie snapped and attacked him with a knife. He grabbed the blade and ended up with a deep wound on his hand. He filed for divorce, moved to Florida, and remarried some other lucky lady. 
As for the other three girls, Laurie Tackett, Tony Lawrence, and Hope Rippey, they were all pretty close friends from early childhood. Hope's parents also divorced when she was a young teen, and she moved away for three years, after which her mother and siblings moved back to Indiana when her parents decided to give their marriage a second chance. Tony was assaulted by a family member at age nine. I'm assuming this was a sexual assault, but I can't find details on that. When she was 14, she was raped by an older teenage boy. Apparently, all that was able to be done about this was a restraining order. Seriously? Police reports were filed. She did what rape victims are supposed to do. And the kid basically just gets away with it. All he has to do is stay away from Tony. Give me a break. Now for Laurie Tackett. Her parents, well at least her mother, was a member of the Pentecostal church. She had pretty strong religious beliefs. But as we have discovered in previous episodes, being religious does not mean you are a decent human being. Her parents both dished out their fair share of child abuse. When Laurie was 14 years old, her mother discovered that she was changing her clothes when she got to school into, gasp, jeans. God forbid the girl wear a pair of denim jeans. When Laurie returned from school that day, her mother tried to strangle her. Child services got involved, but she was still allowed to live at home. They just had surprise check-in visits from CPS. Isn't strangulation basically attempted murder? At least it seems that way to me. Laurie reported she was molested twice as a child, once when she was five and then again at age 12. Laurie's hatred for her parents caused her to rebel. What would piss her mom off the most? Becoming obsessed with the occult. Sorcery, the paranormal, dark magic, and even vampirism. She would tell everyone she knew that she was possessed by a vampire spirit named Deanna. Oh, and she also had a Britney Spears moment and shaved her head. Can I just ask, what the hell is going on in New Albany, Indiana? This seems like a major problem that so many girls have been victims of child abuse and sexual assault. It's so sad. Anyways, back to Laurie. She's a lesbian and started dating a girl who was into self-harm. Before too long, Laurie began to cut herself, too. One day, Laurie, her girlfriend, and Tony were all hanging out together. All three of them were cutters. Laurie cut herself so deep that she had to be hospitalized. As you can imagine with this type of injury, she was interviewed by a psychiatrist. She was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and stayed for a while in the psychiatric ward. Laurie dropped out of high school and did some couch surfing at friends' houses. This is when she met Melinda Loveless. The two became inseparable friends. Laurie ended up moving back home when her dad bribed her with a new car. Even after she was back living with her family, she still spent the majority of her time hanging out with Melinda. I'm going to try to keep this as simple as possible so it doesn't get confusing. So, we've established that Laurie is a lesbian. Apparently, Melinda is too, but they're just friends. Melinda came out to her mom, who was initially super pissed off, but eventually came around. When Melinda was 14 years old, she started dating a girl named Amanda. By the end of the school year, their relationship had fizzled. Now we introduce Chandra to the story. The following school year at Hazelwood Junior High, Amanda, Melinda's ex, picked a fist fight with the new girl, Chandra. While in detention, the two connected, which seems strange because I remember detention as just sitting in silence, unless this was a breakfast club situation. Chandra, as it turns out, is also a lesbian. Her and Amanda started dating. So Chandra is 12 years old. 12. I feel like when I'm talking about these girls and their romantic relationships, they seem so much older. But no, Chandra is 12 and Amanda is a few years older. The two attended a school dance together where Melinda made a scene while confronting the couple. Even though Melinda herself was dating other people, she was extremely jealous of Amanda dating this younger girl. 
In October of 1991, Chandra and Amanda were at a fall festival together. Melinda was publicly making death threats towards Chandra. Not only that, but Melinda wrote Chandra letter after letter threatening her life. When Chandra's parents became aware of the situation, they took it very seriously and turned the letters over to quote-unquote a youth prosecutor who did nothing about it. They transferred Chandra to another junior high school to avoid further drama and confrontation from Melinda. January 10th, 1992. Laurie drives Hope and Tony over to her friend Melinda's house. Hope had only met Melinda once, and this was the first time that Tony and Melinda had came in contact. When they arrived to Melinda's house, Melinda showed the girls a knife and said she was going to scare a girl named Chandra with it, because Chandra stole her girlfriend. No, bitch, you broke up. You both started seeing other people, and you were just obviously not over Amanda. For some strange reason, this group of girls, some who barely even knew Melinda, were all okay with going to threaten a complete stranger with a deadly weapon. Hope drove the group to Chandra's house. Hope and Tony go up and knock on the door. When Chandra answers, they explain that they are all friends of Amanda's, and they were here to pick her up to meet Amanda at this abandoned stone house that the locals called the Witch's Castle. My alarm bells would be ringing. If I had no plans with Amanda, no way would I be leaving with two strangers to some isolated area claiming that Amanda was there waiting for me. Super sketchy. But there's no cell phones to easily get in contact like we do now, and I doubt the witch's castle has a landline. Chandra says she can't go now because her dad is still up. She asked them to come back for her around midnight. The four girls went and enjoyed a punk rock show in the meantime. On the way back to Chandra's house, Melinda stated that she couldn't wait to kill Chandra. The other girls must have just ignored that comment because they were still under the assumption that they were just going to scare her. They returned to Chandra's house around 12.30 a.m. This time, it was Hope and Laurie that went to the door. Chandra got into the car where Melinda was hiding in the back of the car under a blanket, knife in hand. After a while of driving and chatting amongst the girls, Melinda pounces from the back and puts the knife to Chandra's throat, interrogating her about her and Amanda's sexual relationship. They did end up at the witch's castle. Once they got there, they tied Chandra's arms and legs. They tried to scare Chandra by telling her that the witch's castle was full of human remains and spirits and that she was going to join them. Laurie got an old t-shirt from the car and lit it on fire as an intimidation tactic, but the girls immediately realized how stupid this was because the fire could possibly be spotted by traffic driving by. They put Chandra back into the car and drove off. Early 1990s problems. The girls got lost. There's no GPS or Google Maps to help direct you back then. Plus, it's dark. They concealed Chandra with a blanket and pull into a gas station to ask for directions. While Laurie is inside getting directions, a clearly anxious Tony phoned a friend. She didn't mention the situation, but she needed to talk to someone to ease her nerves a bit. They eventually found their way back towards Laurie's house and pulled off into a wooded area. Tony and Hope were second-guessing this plan. They stayed in the car while Melinda and Laurie began torturing Chandra. They took off all her clothes, and Melinda repeatedly punched Chandra in the face. Then Melinda took Chandra's head and beat it off of her knee a few times. She grabbed the knife and tried to slit her throat. But the knife she brought was so dull it wouldn't cut. Hope gets out of the car and helps hold Chandra still while Melinda and Laurie stab her in the chest. Then they strangle her with a rope until she passed out. They assume she was dead and put her in the trunk of the car. They drove back to Laurie's house and the girls went inside to clean up. But they hear something. It's Chandra. She's alive and screaming in the trunk of the car. Laurie grabs a paring knife and goes out to finish the job before Chandra wakes up her parents. At 2.30 a.m., Melinda and Laurie decide to go for a joy ride. Hope and Tony have had enough excitement for one night and end up going to bed. While the girls were out driving, they could hear more noises coming from the trunk. 
They pull over, pop the trunk, and Chandra shoots up. She can't speak, but she's fighting so hard to stay alive. Laurie grabs a tire iron from the trunk and beats Chandra with it until she stops moving. Once again, the girls assume she's dead and head back home. Lori's mom wakes up to the sound of her chatting with her friends and is angry that they were out so late. She insists that she takes her friends home. Instead, they drive to a gas station. They filled up their tank and they bought a two liter of soda. They dumped the soda out and fill the bottle up with gas. They drove to a desolate area and popped the trunk. Hope sprayed Chandra with Windex and said, quote, you're not looking so hot now, are you? Unquote. They pulled Chandra out of the trunk and laid her on the ground, doused her body with the gasoline and lit her on fire. Chandra was actually still alive. The girls go to McDonald's for a damn sausage McMuffin as if nothing happened, as if they didn't just burn a 12-year-old girl alive. While they were there, Tony made a call from the payphone and confessed to a friend what happened. That didn't take long. Laurie drove Hope and Tony home and then returned back to her house with Melinda. They called Amanda and told her that they killed Chandra. Amanda thought this was a joke. The two drove to pick up Amanda later that day and showed her the trunk where you could still see bloody handprints. Melinda then kissed Amanda, told her she loved her, and asked her not to tell anyone what happened. What the actual F? (laughs) This girl is batshit crazy. And maybe Amanda was scared. I don't know the reason, but she goes inside to her house and does not report the incident. That morning, Chandra's dad woke up to find that she was missing from her room. He called around, but no one knew where she was. He finally called her mother, and the two filed a missing person report with the police. It doesn't take long for Chandra's body to be found. Just a few hours after her death, a couple of hunters stumbled upon her burned remains. Investigators start collecting evidence from the site and, for whatever reason, think this murder is linked to a drug deal. By the end of that day, Hope and Tony completely broke. Together, they went to the police station and confessed. You helped brutally kill a 12-year-old girl you don't even know for no reason whatsoever. Because Melinda was jealous? These two barely even knew Melinda. This case honestly blows my mind. It's junior high. Relationships come and go. You can't just go killing everyone that dates your ex. Hope and Tony gave up Melinda and Lori's names in their confession and described what happened the previous night the best they could. Melinda and Lori were arrested the following morning. All four girls were tried as adults and accepted plea bargains to avoid a death sentence. I'm just going to go over how long the girls ended up serving because sentencing was different for each one and the judges made changes through the years. Tony Lawrence served nine years plus two on parole. Hope Rippey, 14 years and five on parole. Laurie Tackett, 25 years and one additional year on parole. Melinda Loveless served 26 years and I believe is still on parole. During Melinda's trial, the truth about her father's abuse came to light. Larry Loveless was charged with rape and sexual battery, The shitty part is that Indiana has a five-year statute of limitations, meaning since the events happened over five years ago, the charges were dropped, which just doesn't seem right. This case makes me so sad. I feel bad for the girls involved with their horrific upbringing, but I literally cannot imagine the torture 12-year-old Chandra Shara endured at their hands, especially as a mother. It's completely heartbreaking. There was an episode of the Dr. Phil show titled In Cold Blood, where Chandra's mother and sister were in the studio. It also featured an in-person interview with Hope Rippey and Amanda Hevron, Chandra's girlfriend at the time of her death. They try to understand why Hope is smiling from ear to ear in her mugshot after confessing to participating in the murder. She says that officers were trying to perk her up because she was crying. Apparently, they had kids her age and felt bad for her or something. Anyways, she claims they were joking around with her and got her to smile for her mugshot. 
Hope said she was actually very sad and upset. Even though she sprayed Chandra with Windex in the trunk and helped doused her with gasoline just the night before. Both Hope and Laurie from previous interview claim peer pressure. They said they would have never committed a crime like this on their own without the instruction of Melinda Loveless. Amanda says that Chandra's mother had made her life hell since the murder. Amanda was partially blamed since she did not speak up when she was informed of what happened. Amanda says that Melinda wrote her letters stating she was going to kill Chandra too. She also claimed to turn letters over to a child prosecutor but never heard anything more about it. She was considered a child molester due to Chandra's young age and their sexual relationship. Amanda swears that Chandra was actually the one that came on to her, and she never did anything with Chandra that was unwanted. Amanda regrets not immediately calling 911 when Melinda confessed to killing Chandra. She said part of her knew it was true, but she didn't want to believe it, and she was scared. Chandra's mother believes that Amanda belonged in jail with Melinda, Laurie, Hope, and Tony. Big thanks to my father-in-law, Greg Holmes Sr., for the recommendation this week. He listens to every episode and is one of my biggest supporters. Next week is my special episode with Stu that will air on British Murders Thursday, February 18th. I'll be talking about Texas serial killer Charles Albright, a.k.a. the Eyeball Killer. If you want to support the show, you can leave a review on Apple Podcasts or visit buymeacoffee.com slash killer stories where you can leave a one-time donation. Follow me on Twitter at Killer Stories PC. Seriously, guys, follow me on Twitter. I'm new to it and my following is pathetic. Instagram and TikTok at Killer Stories Podcast. Email any story suggestions to Killer Stories Podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, this has been a killer story.